Shabbat Shalom. Thank you all for joining us today. I'd like to welcome you to the Olive Tree Messianic Fellowship. For those of you that are watching live on Facebook right now, I know we're a little bit late in getting started. It's noon, and some, we try to start at 1140. Sometimes it could be 1135. Here's what I always tell everybody. Just tune in, be sitting there at home, have our Facebook page ready to go, Roku ready to go, or, or on our website, and just wait for us to get started. Amen? If we're always late, just sit in your living room and say, well, thank God they must be having a good day today. They're, they're praising worship, the tour service, they're having a good time. And then say to yourself, I just need to hop in the car and drive on over there. Amen? So uh, uh, it's a good thing when we're late. Thank you for joining us again. Today is March the 30th, 2019. March 30th, 2019. This is a unique fifth Shabbat in the month. We don't normally have five Shabbats. Uh, maybe every three months we do. But on the Hebrew calendar, it is the 23rd day of Adar the second. It feels like we've been in Adar a long time. We have, two months. Uh, n next week, I don't think we're in Adar. I think next week is Nisan first, I think. But don't quote me on that. Uh, this is the Hebrew year of 5779, 5779. Hey, go to olivetreemessianic.org, www.olivetreemessianic.org. There you will find all the announcements. Uh, you will find the tour portion outline. I know you get tired of hearing me go over this all the time, but maybe there's somebody out there watching that's never heard this before. And you need to hear this. There you will find the place for you to give. Maybe you live a long ways off. You're good at using electronics. You can give through PayPal. Uh, maybe you want to mail your check in. Uh, you can find the P.O. box on there as well. You can also find our physical address to come join us. And I encourage you to come join us. Even though it's a long ways off, I guarantee you'll enjoy it. Amen. We've got some here that will... Uh, uh, testify to that. So please come and join us. Today's tour portion is number 26, Shemini, which means eighth, referring to the eighth day. Uh, there's many eighth days in Scripture. What does the number eight mean? New beginnings. That's right. New beginnings. Today is the seventh day of the week. Tomorrow is really the first day, but it's kind of like an eighth day. It's a new beginnings for us. It's a start over again, right? Amen. And you can see the readings there on your screen behind you. Uh, so I'm not going to read over those again. Okay, the title of today's message. I'm going to jump right into this because I feel like I'm, I'm going to have a lot to say about this message, okay? The title of today's message is Biblical Eating. Biblical eating. Now, maybe you're watching this and you say, Biblical eating. Oh, I'm going to tune into this, see what he has to say about this. Maybe I ought to teach this message on January 1st every year. You know, everybody's thinking about a diet. Um, yes, this is about the dietary laws, but don't tune me out. Maybe you say, well, I've heard this before. You need to hear it again. Because there's verses in here. Okay, so let's say you're watching this. Can you explain Mark chapter 7 to somebody? If they throw it up to you. Can you explain Acts 10? Can you explain Romans 14? Can you explain Colossians 2? If not, listen to this message. Okay? Maybe you have some question. How many of you throughout the year you've thought about... Oh, I'm at a restaurant. I don't know if this is kosher or not. You need to hear the message today. What does the word kosher mean, even? You need to hear the message today. Do, can I only buy food that has that stamp on it in the grocery store? You need to hear the message today. Okay, so let's get started with it. In Torah portion Shemini, the Lord tells us He did not create all animals to be food for mankind. Right off the bat there with that very first statement, it's a home run statement right there. Right off the bat. 
the Lord did not create all animals to be food for mankind. How many of you, somebody's told you, oh, we can eat whatever we want to eat? Well, turn around and ask them then, okay? Do you eat your dog? Do you eat your cat? Do you eat a skunk? I mean, think about that statement for a second. You know, a lot of God's Word can be understood if we just put some common sense into it, right? The word unclean. Now, here's why you need to get into the, your original Hebrew and Greek. I have a study Bible at home. It's the, uh, the, the King James Version Hebrew Greek Study Bible. I love that study Bible. Don't have to use it as much today because the blueletterbible.com and a lot of the electronics that you have. Uh, but the word unclean in Leviticus 11.4 by the way, this whole message is geared toward Leviticus 11. We're not going to read there today, but you need to go home and read it yourself. The word unclean in Leviticus 11.4 is better understood as, write these down if you're taking notes, not food or off limits or unfit for human consumption. Not food, off limits, unfit for human consumption. That's what he's talking about when he says unclean in Leviticus 11.4. Off limits is a good definition for uh, the, the sacrifices. These animals are off limits for the sacrifices. Not for food, of course, is a good definition for these animals is not for you to eat. God's saying, I didn't create them for you to eat. Now, God has a purpose, as I'm going to say a little bit later in the message. God didn't mess up in creating those, right? God has a purpose for everything. What's the purpose for your dog and your cat? Yeah, companionship, especially the dog, but for protection. What about the cat? Companionship and catching rats and so forth. Yeah, I heard the nothing back there. Uh, they, they, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not a huge animal lover. I, I like animals, but I don't like them in my house. I think they have their place. But some of you disagree with me on that. That's okay. Uh, let me say this. Uh, here's a quiz for you. Where is the first dietary law, food law, given in the Bible. Genesis what? It's in the garden. Don't eat from that tree. The first law ever broke was a dietary law, a food law. Think about that for a second. That's important. Very important. These same food instructions, you know, I, I call it instructions because a lot of people, especially here in America, we got that big freedom bent here in America. Freedom! So their food instructions, the loving, kind, caring instructions, are still in effect today for all of God's people. I'm going to point out a little bit later there's two things that I really emphasize here at the olive tree a lot. Number one, that this is one whole Bible. There's no separating it from beginning to end. Number two, it's all about Yeshua. All about Yeshua. Okay, let me throw a third thing in. I said there's two things. There's a third thing. Number three, the laws of God did not start with Mount Sinai given to the Jewish people, they started in the very beginning. Adam and Eve, they knew the law. Noah knew the law, as I'm going to emphasize a little bit later. And I just closed my Bible and I lost my place. Uh, but that's something that I emphasize a lot here at the olive tree, and for good reason. Now I want to just run down a list of clean and unclean animals for you based off of Leviticus chapter 11. 
Again, we're not going to read in Leviticus 11. But besides Leviticus 23, Leviticus 11 should be another chapter that you guys should know about and are familiar with. And as I'm going to mention a little bit later, but I'm going to get ahead of myself, okay? What is the number... I've already told you guys this. What is the number one reason we do anything? Anything. Who? One word. Yeshua. If you start any type of, uh, of conversation with somebody with that, well, then you're starting off on the right foot. As a matter of fact, you might finish the conversation right there because you just might blow their mind. But if you start off by saying Leviticus 11, well, then you, you're going to open up a can of worms. They're going to flood you. They're going to say, we don't have to do this. We don't have to do that. And then you're going to have to start explaining to them Mark 7, Acts 10, and so on and so on. But if you start off by saying, everything I do, Sabbath, feast, dietary laws, everything is about one word, one person. Yeshua. Okay, so the list of clean and unclean animals in Leviticus 11. First, I want to talk about the land animals. It, it talks about in Leviticus 11, land animals, fish, and birds. Okay? Land animals, fish, and birds. The land animals. A clean land animal will have two things. Do you know what it is? That's right. A divided or split hoof, and they chew the cud. In other words, think of a cow's hoof, okay? It's going to be split like that. You know, he's got the hoof. A deer has that same thing, right? They chew the cud. It's like they're chewing chewing gum. It has to have both of those things, not just one, but both of those things. A pig has a split hoof, right? But he don't chew the cud. Right? And there's other characteristics that are bad about the pig, too. You know, there's, there's some characteristics that are bad about clean animals, too. You know, I've heard people tell me that a chicken's the nastiest animal in the world. But God created them to be eaten. That's the difference. And, you know, some people tell me, too, well, Robert, I can just bless whatever I want to and then eat whatever I want. You're no music... Uh, you're, you, you can't perform magic. I about said musician. You're no musician. I'm saying that wrong. But you cannot do magic and change the, that animal into something that's now good to eat. Right? Your blessing does not do that. It's still the same animal. So let me give you a list of clean land animals. Bison. Not one that I've, I don't think I've ever ate, but bison. Cattle. Now, that's a popular one here in the South. Deer. That's another popular one. Elk. That's a popular one up North. Goat. We've got a lady here that I want to eat some of her goats. And she'll bring them. <laughs> Moose. Moose is another popular one up North. Maybe in Russia, too. I don't know. And, of course, sheep. Sheep. Now, Yeshua, a lot of people think Yeshua uh, ate a lot of sheep, but sheep was a little more of a delicacy. I think he ate more fish than anything. Uh, he definitely didn't eat a lot of cattle. Goats and sheep is the poor man's livestock. Cattle is getting into more expensive but fish, that's the, that's the poor man's meal right there. Okay, now let me talk to you about an unclean land animal. Now listen up. Especially if you live here in the south, you've ate many of these. When you were younger, when you didn't know any better. Swine or pig. Now I'm going to talk about them a little bit later in the message. Uh what God created them for. There's a purpose for them. Right? But it's not for us to eat. Bear. Many uh, good old southern boys around here, they like going hunting and eating bear. 
That's not what God created them for. Rabbit. Squirrel. And now this one, I just don't quite get why anybody would want to eat it unless, you're, you're, and, unless some people were starving and maybe eat it. Horse. Uh, again, some of these you just don't get. And I could add more onto that. I could add dog. I could add cat. All those are unclean, right? Amen? I know this is not an exciting message for some of you. Put a smile on your face. And, and, and uh, th- this is important for you. Now let me talk to you about fish. Clean fish and unclean fish. A clean fish has to have two things. What are they? Fins and scales. Fins and scales. Some of you in the back might be cheating. You might be looking at my notes back there because I give you the notes to follow along with me on the video. Fins and scales must have both. A clean fish would be an anchovy. Do you know that? Yeah, I'm not a big fan of that either. Bass, not like that. Uh, bluegill, carp, cod, flounder, pollock. That's a popular one at most restaurants. Alaskan pollock. Salmon, tilapia. Tilapia is another popular one. Going back to salmon for a second, I know that was a big one of my grandfather. He liked salmon patties. That was his favorite. You'd go into his house, you'd smell he was cooking salmon patties. Trout and tuna. Tuna fish, that's another popular one. Now some unclean fish, and unfortunately these are popular too, but you don't need to eat them. Johnny Henson, catfish. Johnny's born on the Mississippi River. Uh, Catfish, unclean. These guys were bottom feeders, a catfish was. Now think about this for a second. If you drop something in the water, where does it fall to? The bottom. Who eats it? The catfish and the shrimp and the other things. You don't want to eat a bottom feeder. God created them to be... Have any of you ever had a fish tank and you got that one fish that cleans the tank for you? That's what... Yeah, that's what these bottom feeders do. They clean the tank for you. Would you eat that fish? He's important to your tank, right? You don't want to eat him. So catfish, clam, any fish with a shell, clam, crab. Now they make imitation crab made from tilapia. Now that's good. They do make imitation crab. And a matter of fact, I'll give you a clue. If you ever eat Chinese, you've got to ask, though. You've always got to ask. But most Chinese restaurants that are inland, away from the sea, most of their crab ragoon and this and that is made from imitation crab. But ask them, though, first. Don't just order it. Ask them. Frog. That's another one from the south. Frog legs, not kosher. By the way, kosher means fine or it's okay. It's appropriate. That's what kosher means. Uh, you can use that word for, for anything. Is this kosher for me to do? That means is this okay for me to do? Is it fine? But most of the time when we say kosher, it's referring to food. Okay, continuing on. Unclean fish, lobster. Mussel, never ate that before, but octopus, oyster, scallop, and then here's a popular one, shrimp, and then squid. But let me talk about shrimp for a second. How many of you would eat a cockroach? The shrimp is the cockroach of the sea. You don't want to eat those, okay? They're crawling around in the bottom of the sea like a roach, a cockroach. God has a plan for them, but it's not for you to eat them. Okay? Okay, let me talk about birds now. What is the characteristics of a clean bird? 
Well, now that one is a little bit harder to find in Leviticus chapter 11. It doesn't plainly state it. But a clean bird basically must not be a bird of prey. Okay? Uh, have you ever seen a, uh, a vulture? He's cleaning up the roadkill. He's a bird of prey. He's not for you to eat. Okay? So let me name you some clean birds. The number one clean bird is chicken. Again, a lot of people would say, uh, Joan's still in the, uh, in the Purim spirit, yay for the chicken. <laughs> there we go. We could say yay for the clean animals and boo for the unclean. Uh, but a chicken, again, a lot of people say, ah, chickens are nasty, dirty animals, but God made them to be good for you to eat. Another one is a dove. I have a lot of the gray doves on my home. I just, at my home, I love it when they land on my sukkah. I, I just sit there and look at them all day when they're on that. Uh, another one is duck, goose, pigeon, quail, swan. And then here's the, the, probably the second most famous clean bird, turkey. That is one of my favorite ones. I love turkey. Okay, unclean birds. I don't, these unclean birds, I don't know of anybody who's ate these. I mean, this is just common sense. Bat, buzzard, again, a bird of prey. You don't want to eat these. A crane. I just love watching them. I wouldn't eat them for nothing. I, uh, have any of you ever seen the big cranes? Beautiful. Crow. Eagle. Now, if I'm not mistaken, it's a uh, bald eagle. That's illegal to kill here in America. Hawk. Ostrich. Owl. Seagull. Stork. Or a vulture. I mean, you could add some others to those as well. Uh, probably an emu. Yeah, a peacock. Yeah, I mean, you could go on and on with these, right? I have a book. I should have brought that book up here with me today. It's a red, yeah, that's a red book. It's in our library back there. It has a list of these things in it. And I love the name of the book. It's called Holy Cow. Because <laughs> cow's kosher. It's a set-apart cow. So get that book. It's, uh, it was originally done by First Fruits Design, a good balanced ministry. I share many of, those, many of their sayings on Facebook. So check out that book. It's called Holy Cow. Okay, again, I told you that a lot of the law was given before there was an Israel. A lot of the law was given before there was a Jew, right? But, though... Even when the law was given to Israel, who was with Israel? Jew and Gentile. Okay? So now I want to go back and point out things to you. Clean and unclean instructions before the law was officially given. The law was officially given at Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter 20. That's when the Ten Commandments started. That's when Moses was on the, uh, the mountain and the 613 commandments was given unto him. But the law was known well before that. I've already told you about the, the apple and with Adam and Eve. But did you know that Abel apparently, again, apparently knew about the clean and unclean instructions when he sacrificed a what? What did Abel sacrifice in Genesis chapter 4, verses 2 through 4? Yeah, a, a, a lamb, a sheep. He didn't sacrifice a pig. He sacrificed a lamb. Noah knew about the clean and unclean instructions. When he took onto the ark seven couples, seven males, seven females, that's 14, seven couples of clean animals, but only one couple, only one male, one female of unclean animals. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 7. 
So do you think Noah, okay, if he only had one couple, one male, one female of the pigs, do you think when he got on there, he said, let's have a big barbecue. And he slaughtered the pig and he ate it. He couldn't have. You know why? We wouldn't have pigs today. Do, why wouldn't we have pigs today? You got to have male and female to have more piglets, right? So he couldn't have ate one. He knew about this. Why do you think he had 14 cows, for example? Barbecue and sacrifice, both. Yeah, you had to have more of the clean animals because you were going to eat them and you were going to sacrifice after the flood was over, right? Right? Okay, continuing on. That, that's really three points I've made before the law was ever given. The garden, Noah's, uh, the garden, Abel, Noah. Now here's a fourth one, and this fourth one is just more general, okay? Throughout the book of Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if you look at all their sacrifices, they only offered clean animals before the Lord. You ever thought about that? Throughout the book of Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and you go back to Abel, they only offered clean animal sacrifices. So these clean and unclean laws is more than just about what we are to eat, right? It's also about the sacrifice. And see, that's why it points back to Yeshua. Yeshua is our sacrifice. God accepted him as the sacrifice. He was clean. Amen? Okay, now, let's say you're watching this and you say, Robert, I, I, I agree with everything you just told me, but what about the New Testament? Well, first of all, let me point out this. Yeshua did not come to change everything in the Old Testament. He did not come to go against God. He was God in the flesh. If Yeshua broke anything in the Old Testament, number one, he would have been a sinner, and he would not have been a clean and perfect sacrifice. Number two, he would not have been the Messiah. He would not have been that Mashiach that the Jewish people were waiting for. So now I want to point out to you, you know, last week we had Salim here, and he, he made a great important point to us the difference between jealousy and being envious. Did you guys hear that point that he made? Being envious of something is like you envy your neighbor's car or you envy your neighbor's home. You've never owned their home. You've never owned their car, but you're envious of it. But being jealous of it is if they took your wife or your husband, something that is yours, you own it, it is yours, but now somebody else has it, and you're jealous. Okay, put that with the Messiah. That's the Jewish Messiah. It is their Messiah, and we have him. That's why you have to emphasize so many times Messianics, we emphasize the wrong thing. Law, 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 Torah, Torah, Torah. If you emphasize Yeshua... The Jewish Messiah to the Jewish people, that will make them jealous. Amen? And again, these dietary laws. If, if you, to, to a Jewish person, it seems silly that the Gentiles are keeping these things. But again, if you emphasize to them Yeshua, then you're going to make them jealous. Right? Then they're going to see why you keep these things. Because you're only following the Jewish Messiah. Their Messiah. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 7. And in Mark 7, here we have the eating of grain with unwashed hands. Okay, so that blows apart any argument that people say that Mark 7, that... Mark 7 is all about the cleansing of these meats, the cleansing of these animals. Mark 7 is not even about meat. It doesn't mention any animal. You tracking with me? 
Let's read it. Mark 7. The first verse I want to read is verse 5. Just one verse. Verse 5. If you're watching this online, you see it at the bottom of your screen. The Pharisees and Torah scholars. Now, if you're reading the King James, it says the scribes. The Pharisees and the scribes. I'm going to open up my King James here because I want to emphasize something to you in just a second from the King James. I also have my complete Jewish Bible here with me as well. But I'm reading from the Tree of Life. The Pharisees and the Torah scholars questioned Yeshua. Why don't your disciples walk according to the tradition of the elders? Stop there. Right there tells you what they're talking about in this chapter. They're talking about traditions, not God's law. You with me? It's the same thing when you get on over to Colossians a little bit later. We're going to read that as well. Colossians chapter 2. Again, they're talking about traditions of men. So, they asked Yeshua, why don't your disciples follow these traditions? Now, I'm not against every tradition, okay? But if it goes against God's Word, I'm against it. If it, okay, okay, they had a tradition of washing their hands. That's good, right? But when you tell somebody, if you don't wash your hands, you're a sinner and you're going to hell. Okay, now you're stepping over your bounds. You see? There you're putting the traditions above this. And then they asked him, I'm still in verse 5, Why do they eat bread, not meat, but bread with unwashed hands? See, this is why it's so important that you don't take Scripture out of context. A lot of people would immediately jump to verse 19, and they would read the last part of verse 19, where it says, cleansing all foods. Or some translations there say, thus he cleansed all foods. Read the whole chapter, folks. Read it in context to what he's talking about. And read it in the way saying Yeshua would not do away with God's law, nor would his disciples do away with God's law. Okay, let's jump down to verse 17. You can see I'm, even though this is just something simple like dietary laws, you can see I'm passionate about it. I believe in what I'm saying to be true. Verse 17. When he, Yeshua, had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. Even his disciples didn't quite get it. Verse 18. And he said to them, Are you then also lacking understanding? Don't you grasp that whatever goes into the man cannot make him unholy? The tree of life uses the word unholy there. Verse 19. But it does not enter into the heart, but into the stomach. And then goes into the sewer, or the draught, I believe is what the old King James says. In other words, the plumbing of your home, the restroom. Cleansing all foods. Okay, stop there a second. First of all, what food are they talking about here? Bread. They're, talk they're basically talking about dirty food that you just ate with unwashed hands. God made our bodies to be able to take that and to fight that off and to cleanse that and get it on out of your system, right? But now eating unclean meat, though, yeah, that messes with your body. That messes with your system, right? Because he didn't make it to be eaten. So when he says, when, when he says here in verse 18, whatever goes into the man, he's talking about clean food. Whatever goes into the man cannot make him unholy, whether you washed your hands or not. Remember, that's the topic in verse 5. And then where it says, cleansing all foods, what is food? Is pig food? Is frog food? Is shrimp food? No. So when he says cleansing all foods, even though it's just talking about bread here, if you wanted to add cow and goat and sheep and tilapia, if you wanted to add all that to this, you can. But it's not talking about pig. 
and shellfish and so on and so on. You see? And let me point something else to you. How many of you have a Bible translation that where it says, Thus he cleansed all foods? At the very end of verse 19. How many of you have one? It's in parentheses. You know why it's in parentheses? Do, do, is yours a red letter edition or not? Any of yours red? Yours red? Okay, is everything red except for that in the parentheses, thus he cleansed all foods, or is it red? Purging all meats, okay. Well, okay, a New American Standard. It has, thus he declared all foods clean in parentheses, and it's black, meaning not Yeshua's words. Okay, the, you know, you have different Greek scrolls, right? Unfortunately, the Greek was not copied as well as the, uh, the Greek New Testament was not copied as well as the Hebrew Old Testament. Why? The Hebrew Old Testament was copied by professional scribes, and they counted every letter, they counted every word. But the Greek was copied by different Christians, a lot of times in the dark by candlelight because they were persecuted and they were hiding. Mistakes were made. Okay? So... That's why you had the different Greeks. Okay, all the Greeks have that last phrase in there. Purging all foods, thus he declared all foods clean, cleansing all foods, it's all in there. But the oldest of the Greek manuscripts set that phrase, they, they emphasize it as if Mark was the one who said it. That's why in the New American Standard, it's in black. It's not red letter. You see what I'm saying? But, though, but, it's still God's Word. It's still in every Greek. It's still in our Holy Bible. It still doesn't make all foods, pig and things and that, because they're not food. It still doesn't make all that clean. Do you see what I mean? And I like what the old King James says. It purges all food, cow, bread, you see what I mean? It gets it out of your body that you ate with unwashed hands. You maybe cooked it in a dirty skillet. It purges it and gets it all out. Amen? Yeah, and I, I disagree with the complete Jewish Bible there a little bit. I think that they throw an extra word in there that kind of confuses you. Even the uh, Tree of Life version, cleansing all foods. I, I can go along with that. Because, again, it's talking about food is cattle and clean animals. But I like what the old King James says, purging all foods. I thank God that he made our bodies like that because I'm, I can't cook. And uh, sometimes, uh, you know, my, my wife, Kim, she does the cooking. She sometimes leaves and sets things out for me to eat. And sometimes she's had some things... Here's the food, and here's something that's trash she's throwing away, and I don't know what the difference is, and I just, I ate what she had laid out to throw away. But, uh, and, and it was clean food, it was kosher, but it was probably ruined, but my body, thank God, was able to withstand that, amen? <laughs> amen? And then she asked me, why do you eat that? Well, you had it sitting now right beside my other food. Um, so, that's Mark chapter 7. Now, what about Acts 10, Robert? Maybe some of you are watching Acts 10. Peter had the vision and God told him to kill and eat. Well, let's turn there. Here we see Peter's dream of unclean animals. Unclean animals. Let's turn there and look. Acts chapter 10. Are you guys getting this? The first verses that I want to read in Acts 10 is verse 9. Uh, I might paraphrase this and jump through it real quickly. In verse 9, the next day, soldiers, they were traveling uh, to a city. Peter went up to the rooftop to pray. Okay? It was about the sixth hour. Uh, verse 10, he was very hungry. He wanted to eat. Uh, but while they were preparing something, he fell into a trance. He got a little sleepy. Any of you ever, some of you are sleepy right now. Uh, he got very sleepy. Verse 11. 
he saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet coming down, lowered by its four corners to the earth. Stop there for a second. What do you think that was? Lowered by the four corners. When you hear the four-cornered garments... Yeah, I'm out of the screen now. I'm sorry. But, zeet, zeet. A four-cornered garment. He lowered it by the four corners. Okay, continue on. Uh, Verse 12. In it were all sorts of four-footed animals and reptiles and birds of the air. Now, initially it doesn't say that they're unclean animals. But if you keep reading, Peter shows that they are. Verse 13, a voice came to him. Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Verse 14, but Peter said, certainly not, Adonai. For never have I eaten anything unholy or unclean. Then verse 15. Again a voice came to him a second time. What God has made clean, you must not consider unholy or common. I believe is what the King James there says. Okay, stop there for a second. A lot of people look at verse 16 and they say, See, we can eat whatever we want to eat. But Peter didn't quite get the vision. He didn't quite understand it. He said, now this doesn't make sense, God. Peter's a smart man. If you ever have, okay, if you're married and God ever tells you, if you're married and you have a vision that says, divorce your spouse and go marry your neighbor's spouse. You think that's from God? No. You need to do what Peter said here. Wait a minute. This doesn't sound right. Okay? That's what Peter did. So, two things I want to point out here. One, if if God changed the dietary laws, if Yeshua changed the dietary laws back in Mark chapter 7, Peter didn't get it, did he? (laughs) He was still following them in Acts chapter 10. In Acts 10, Peter said, I've never eaten anything unclean. So, Peter didn't get it back in Mark 7 if Yeshua changed the dietary laws. You tracking with me? Okay, that's the one thing I want to point out. The second thing I want to point out, has there ever been a dream in Scripture where maybe you've had dreams where the dream had one thing in it, but it didn't mean that. That's, that symbolized something else. Can any of you remember a dream in Scripture like that? Pharaoh. Pharaoh dreamed of cows and corn. Was his dream about cows and corn? Nope. It was about seven years of famine and seven years of plenty. Actually, Flip that around, plenty first, and then the famine. So, Peter saying this dream can't mean what I think it means. It has to mean something else. Well, we don't have to question what it meant because Peter himself gives us the interpretation, but nobody ever reads it. Skip down to verse 25. Now, God has a reason for giving Peter the dream. The tradition of the Jews was to not associate with Gentiles. God was sending a Gentile to Peter. And he had to get across to Peter that you need to accept this Gentile. Right? Verse 25. As Peter entered... Cornelius, that's the Gentile, met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter did the right thing in verse 26. But Peter pulled him up saying, stand up, I too am just a man. Verse 27, talking with him, Peter went inside and found many people gathered. Peter went inside a Gentile home. Okay, to the traditional Orthodox Jews of the time to the Pharisees and Sadducees, that was against their traditions. I've attended Passover seders, more Orthodox, conservative seders. 
I have taken things to the Seder, things that were kosher. But guess what? Because I was a Gentile, nope, they didn't accept it. They politely said, oh, thank you, and they took it from me, and I never seen it again. <laughs> never seen it again. Verse 28, he said to them, you yourselves know, Peter said to them, you yourselves know that it is not permitted for a Jewish man to associate with a non-Jew or to visit him. Where's that said in the Bible? It's not. That's the tradition. Yet God, okay, here's the interpretation of the vision. You need to underline this if you write in your Bible. Underline it, highlight it, be ready to show this to people. Yet God has shown me that I should call no one, or the King James says no man, no human being, male or female, unholy or common or unclean. Do you see that? Peter said those animals represented the Gentiles and that he is not to call them common or unclean. You tracking with me? Okay, this next one I don't want to turn there and read. It's in Romans 14. Uh, the reason why I don't want to turn there and read is because you could read all the context there and it's still a little difficult to figure out. You've, you've kinda, you have to know Scripture, okay? In Romans 14, verse 14, well, you don't have to turn there. I'll just read it real quickly to you, okay? Maybe somebody's thrown this verse up to you. I've had somebody quit the church just over this one verse, even though I tried to explain it to them. Romans 14, 14 says, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Yeshua that nothing is unholy in itself or by itself, but it is unholy for the one who considers it unholy. So I've had people tell me, Robert, you consider those, the pig and shellfish, you consider it unclean, but I don't. And therefore, Romans 14 cuts me free from that. They're totally misunderstanding Romans chapter 14. Okay, what is Paul talking about? He's talking about a cow. You tracking with me? a cow or a deer, a clean meat that, is cl that God created to be clean, and somebody of another religion took it, and they offered it up to their God and blessed it and said, whatever God that is, that you've given us this, and we offer it up to you, and we give it unto you. Peter said, nope, or Paul, I mean. Paul said in Romans, nope, that's now... I can't eat it now. That's what he's saying in Romans 14, 14. You got that? Be careful because there's some foods out there in certain restaurants, religious restaurants, that has been blessed by their priest. Okay, I'll just go ahead and tell you what type of religion I'm talking about. I'm talking about Islam. There's... There's meat. Now, Islam, they keep kosher. They don't eat cow. They don't, or they do eat cow, I'm sorry. They don't eat pig and certain things. But they bless it in the name of their God. Therefore, avoid it. Don't eat it. You hear me? That's what Romans 14 is talking about. Things that God created to be eaten, but now because of... Okay, I'll give you another example. Let's say you got a good, clean cow, good steak, and you marinated all night long in pig's fat. <clears throat> I mean, you marinate it real good, and then you go to cook it the next day. What have you done to that? Yeah, you've made it where it's uneatable now, right? So that's another way. You don't know sometimes what you're getting when you go out here to restaurants, even though it's, it's clean. That's right. So, Peter, what Paul says there, if, if, you'd feel, if you feel like you can't eat this cow, if you feel like they've offered it up to something in the kitchen, well, then don't you eat it. But if I feel like it's okay, well, then I'm going to. But... 
it's still clean. It's still biblical. Do you see that? Okay, that's Romans 14. Now let's look at Colossians. In Colossians, I could, I, I've done this before in the past. I could go through the whole chapter with you and teach Colossians chapter 2. People so misunderstand it. But when I explain it to you, it just opens it up. Okay? Just like with uh, Mark chapter 7. Remember Mark chapter 7? You had to start with verse 5, and that set the tone for the rest of the chapter. Colossians 2, you have to start with verse 8. Verse 8 sets the table for you for the rest of the chapter. Verse 8 says, See that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. Is, is God's Word empty deception? No. Is God's Word man's philosophy? No. No. According to the tradition of men. Again, not God's Word. So this whole chapter here is talking about tradition of men and philosophy and empty deception. Okay? It's, it's saying don't let people trick you and take you uh, captive over that. And then it says, according to the tradition of men and basic principles. Is God's Word just basic principles? No. No. Of the world rather than Messiah. So here, that's another important thing. This whole chapter is, is emphasizing Yeshua. Yeshua, Yeshua, Yeshua. You got that? That's what we are to emphasize. So many times we get, especially as Messianics, we can get so picky about little things. And it tears us apart as Messianics. We're, we're missing Messiah and who He is. Amen? Okay, now skip to, well, I'll tell you what, read verse 9. I don't have this on the screen, but read verse 9, because again, it's emphasizing Yeshua. For all the fullness of the deity, showing that Yeshua is God, lives bodily in Him. Okay, now skip down to verse 14. Verse 14. He wiped out the handwritten record of debts. What's it say there in the King James? The handwriting of ordinances. Okay, you know what a lot of people say that is? The law. It's the handwritten record of debts. Your debt he wiped out and nailed it to the cross. What did they put above his head? King of the Jews, Yeshua of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Why did they put that? Because they said that was his sin. They said that's, he is saying that he's the King of the Jews, but he's not. Yeah, it's treason. But he was the King of the Jews. But again, they nailed his debt over his head. They nailed his so-called sin over his head. So he nailed your debt, the lies, stealing, adultery, murder. He nailed all that to the cross, not the law. So he wiped out the handwritten, that, that's why you plead the blood. Through the blood, I'm innocent. Through the blood, all that's been nailed to the cross. He wiped it out. He wiped out the handwritten records of debt with the decrees against us. God's law is not against us, but the sins we committed is against us, which was hostile to us. God's law is not hostile to us. He took it away by nailing it to the cross. Verse 15, After disarming the principalities and powers, He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them, in the cross. Okay, and then here's the big verse. How many of you have ever had verse 16 thrown up to you before? Well, if you hadn't, you will. Okay, in time, you will. Verse 16, Therefore, do not let anyone pass judgment on you in matters of food 
or drink or in respect of a festival or new moon or Shabbat. Now, what is all those things? A festival, of course, that would be the feast, right? A new moon, what would that be? That's God's calendar. Don't, it, it says don't let uh, anyone judge you regarding God's calendar or the Sabbath. But here's the thing. Let, let me read that to you in the Old King James, verse uh, 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, which is food, or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or the Sabbath days. Sabbath days, the feast. But here's what people do. Okay? I'm going to go back to my tree of life now. Listen to how people hear this and how people tell you. Okay? Therefore, do not let anybody pass judgment on you when you eat what you want to eat. When you don't keep the feast, when you don't keep the new moons in God's calendar, and when you don't keep Shabbat, that's how the people read into it. But does it say that? No. No. Don't forget what, what he just talked about here in, in verse 8. Philosophy and traditions of men. Now he's saying in verse 16, this is what he's saying. Don't let anybody pass judgment on you when you keep the dietary laws and not those traditions. When you keep the feast and not those traditions. When you keep God's calendar and not those traditions. When you keep the Sabbath and not those traditions. That's what verse 16 is saying. Are you tracking with me? But verse 17 is very important for, for us as Messianics. This is what we need to emphasize. Therefore, or I'm sorry, these are a foreshadowing of things to come. Now, Yeshua had already come the first time. So this is talking about the second coming. These are a foreshadowing of the second coming. But the reality is Messiah. I believe in the King James there it says... Uh, but the body is of Christ. In other words, it's saying all these things, including the dietary laws, are all about Yeshua. You see that? Now, he's not saying that as a, oh, get, a, a get out of doing this stuff. Oh, we got Yeshua now. We don't have to do it. It, it says that Yeshua, all these things are a shadow of him. Where would you rather be in the world than in the shadow of God, of Yeshua? Doing what He did. Acting as He did. Where else would you rather be? If these feasts are a shadow of Him, where else would you rather be than in His shadow? If the Sabbath is a shadow, where else would you rather be today? Amen? And then I like what verse 18 says as well. Verse 18 goes back to verse 8, back to the original, uh, back to the starting of this chapter. It says, let no one disqualify you by insisting on false humility. Does that say anything about the law? No. And worship of angels, does God command that? No. Again, we're talking about traditions of men. Going into detail about what... He has seen, puffed up without cause by his fleshly mind. That's what disqualifies you, man's traditions that goes against God's word. Vain, empty philosophy that means nothing. And you know what? As I'm emphasizing Yeshua here today, let me say this. You can have all the knowledge in the world that you want about this Bible, and so many Messianics... We try, oh, we want to figure it out perfectly, perfectly. You can understand this Bible perfectly and still die and go to hell. You got me? That's why we can't be so judgmental about other believers out there. They might not know as much as we do concerning the Bible, but if they've accepted Yeshua as their Messiah, we're going to meet them one day in heaven. Amen? 
And don't be so judgmental about other messianics in the congregation who's not on the same path as you or don't believe the same way as you do either. Amen? Love them. Be kind to them. Don't push them. Okay. So that's Colossians 2. You understand that now? Now I want to talk to you a little bit about science and health. Let's say, let's say you still say, Robert, I can eat a pig and still make it to heaven. Well, you might get there quicker than the rest of us will. Amen? I have literally heard of someone who, uh, who he, they ate so much pork that he got worms. Literally. Literally. So, that's why I want to talk about science and health for a second. Everything that God created, like I said earlier, has a purpose. He didn't mess up in creation. The unclean animals were made to clean up the earth. In other words, the unclean animals is a trash can. Would you go eat a trash can? No. Eating unclean animals, then, is bad for the planet. How many of you love the planet? As we, as God's people, we should love the planet, want to take care of the planet, want to take care of His creation. So when you eat an unclean animal, you are doing damage to the planet because you're taken out. Imagine if we eat every shellfish. What would clean the bottom of the oceans? Think about that. It's bad for the environment. For God created unclean animals precisely to clean up the pollution of other animals and other humans. When, we, when these animals are eaten, the environment is seriously impacted. I've told this story many of times, but maybe some of you have never heard it before. How many of you have ever heard about the city of Philadelphia, what they did years ago to clean up their landfills? They had so much stuff, they brought in a bunch of pigs to clean up their landfills. So, uh, imagine that pig then going off to the barbecue joint, and then you going and eating. You, we don't need to eat that stuff. God didn't create it for food, amen? Scientific evidence proves eating unclean animals, or again the trash can, causes disease and even death. The meat of the unclean animals carry more harmful elements than the clean animals. Stats show it takes more than seven days. Statistics show it takes more than seven days for the body to release the toxins from the unclean animals. Did you know that? See, again, our, our body is made, if you eat bread with unwashed hands, our body is made to get rid of that easily. But if you eat an unclean animal, it stays in there longer and it does damage to your body. Now, I'm sure if God was writing his Bible today, he'd probably add a lot more to that. Don't eat this, don't drink that, because there's lots of things in the world today that we eat and drink that's not good for us. But the unclean animals, that toxin stays in you for more than seven days. In the Middle Ages, Jews were accused of sorcery because they escaped many of the sicknesses, such as the Black Plague, that affected others. But it was not because... It, it was not because they uh, they done sorcery. It was because of what? They kept the dietary laws. They kept God's instructions. Now, I know, you know, many people would say, for example, in my own family, they would say, well, your grandfather lived till he was 95, and he ate what he wanted to. There's other things that play in factor here. One is luck. Just just pure luck. Two, you know, uh, he was a hard-working man. That plays into a factor as well. So uh, don't, don't just toss the dice in life and say, well, I hope I get lucky. No, make sure and go 
live your life according to this book. And right before I close, I've got one final thing, and then I'm coming to my closing. I've already told you earlier about the Old Testament and how these laws were known before Leviticus. Well, even after Leviticus, they kept them. And there's a very important one that emphasizes what I'm talking about here with health and science. In Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 through 16... The children, including Daniel, that ate the unclean meat was unhealthy, while Daniel and the other children was healthy. He, Daniel asked the king, the king's servants, the eunuch, he said, uh, Let, we, we don't want to eat this stuff. We want to eat vegetables. They had to totally remember what it said in Romans 14, 14. Paul said, I don't know if this clean cow's been offered up to your God or not. I don't know if this clean cow's been cooked in unclean stuff. So Daniel said, just give us vegetables only and maybe some nuts. Uh, but anyways, no meat, vegetarian. And he said, let's see how we look after so many days and see how these other children look. And sure enough, Daniel was healthier and the other children who ate along with Daniel were healthier than those who ate the unclean meat. Daniel proved it. So, in conclusion, don't put your notes up yet because i got one more Bible verse to quote to you. Eating a clean diet cannot earn us salvation. Because eating the unclean is basically just for us, our physical bodies here. It cannot earn you salvation. But eating an unclean diet is still wrong. And I think I've proven that today by Scripture, Right? We should want to eat clean meat, a clean diet, once the truth has been revealed to us. How many of you, you want to, when you first found out about it, you want to do it? Right? Number one reason? Because your Lord and Master did it. That's the number one reason. Eating a clean diet is another way for us to obey and honor the Lord in all that we do. Like I said during the Torah service. What you wear gives honor and praise to God or dishonor to God. What you eat gives honor and praise to God or dishonor to God. What you say, so on and so on and so on. Your attitude in your heart. It is a way for us to sanctify or set ourselves apart from the Lord on this spiritual journey called life amen you know i already had all this put together before i was even talking to uh, our brother david about life this game called life this spiritual journey we're on called life it's all about our whole life should revolve around this everything at your job place you can't separate work and school you you guys that are still in school you still got to act according to this at school, at your workplace, you still got to act according to this. And here's my last verse I want to quote for you. Write this down, Romans 12, 1. We've been talking about sacrifices, a sacrifice of praise, right? And we have no animal sacrifices today. Romans 12, 1 says, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. That's from the uh, uh, Holman Christian Standard Bible. I like how they worded that. This is your spiritual worship to God, to present your body as a living sacrifice unto Him. Your body, don't put that junk in it. Don't put that unclean stuff in it. Right? Let us pray. Abba, we thank you, Lord, for this message. Uh, Lord, I pray that it speaks to the people. Abba, I pray that you, uh, uh, I, I pray today that through this message, Lord, that your son, Yeshua, our Messiah, was lifted on high. And Lord, that's the most important thing that, we, that I could pray today is for the salvation of the people. 
So I pray that right now, Abba. First of all, I pray that those who are already saved, that their eyes will be open to this message and they will receive understanding and start living according to this message today. But second, Lord, I pray that all those who are lost and never received Yeshua as their Messiah, that they will do so now. Maybe you're listening to this. Maybe you got saved years ago. But you're not really in that close relationship with Him. Well, you need to renew that. Renew that relationship. Renew those vows you took when you first got saved. Those wedding vows. Draw close to Him. If you've never received Yeshua as your Messiah, all you have to do, according to the Apostle Paul, is confess with your mouth that Yeshua is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead and you will be saved. Plain and simple as that. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call upon Him today. Make Him your Lord and your Savior. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and Amen. If everyone would please rise for the ironic benediction. If you're watching us online, uh, gather with your family and your friends and bless one another with these words. Yavarekaka Adonai Vayishmareka Yaher Adonai Penaveleka Vikuneka Yisa Adonai Penaveleka Vayasim Leka Shalom May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace. Peace in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Sar Shalom, our Prince of Peace. Amen and Amen. May God bless you all. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to wish you a Shabbat Shalom, a Shavua Tov. Have a good week. I'll see you next week.